everybody. Welcome back to Two Legs, a Paul McCartney podcast. We are doing episode 242. And uh, as you all know, we are a Paul McCartney talk show, mainly dealing with the solo career of the legend himself, Paul McCartney. I'm one of your two co-hosts, Tom Hunyadi. You may know me from my other show, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. And as always, I'm joined by my partner in crime, my backwards traveler. He is Andy Nichols. Andy, my friend, what you been up to? Happy to be back and doing another fresh episode and a new series and having a, a returning guest and um, colleague of ours. And I'm really excited for this one tonight. Yeah, we, as you can see, we have Alan Cozen here, who is uh, the co-writer, along with Adrian Sinclair, of the, the wonderful, fantastic, arguably the most important uh, book series in the history of McCartney as a solo art, uh, solo recording artist, uh, The McCartney Legacy. And we are starting a new series um, where we take a look at some of these iconic songs throughout McCartney's career. And we thought, who better than... Mr. Cozen and Mr. Claire themselves. Now, unfortunately, Sinclair is not here with us at this time, but hopefully we will have him and or Cozen uh, joining us at any given time. So, um, hey, um, Alan, Cozen, it, it's great to see you. Welcome back, my friend. And how you been? It's great to be back. I've been fine. You know, we, we finished volume two and um, I'm in the process of preparing for volume three by scanning all of my McCartney files and ah. making them into searchable PDFs so that we can okay. um, you know, get to all the info we need. Mm -hmm. um, but that's apart from all of the research Adrian does, which is right. mountainous compared to right. what I have in my files. But we're also, you know, we're getting up to the point where I began covering him for the times right. when I was at the times. Yes. And so my files become quite, you know, more, right. a lot more dense uh, from now on. So I'm looking forward right. to getting to that point. Well, you, I mean, your book, the, the volume two is now up for pre-order and it's had a, a success already. So it was already what the number one um, you know, <laughs> book was, you know, as you, as they say, pre uh, and, and pre-order sales. So that's, that's gotta be pretty exciting. It do is. you have a do you have a, a number a solid number on those pre-sale numbers? Alan? I haven't seen it. Adrian may know, but um, mm. I, I really don't know. But I know that um, shortly after they announced it was open for uh, for pre-sale, Amazon had it listed as the number one new rock right. book. Um, which, given that nobody has a copy um, and it hasn't even really been edited yet, mm. um, that's right. actually not bad, you know. <laughs> Speaking yep. speaking of editing, when when do Annie and I when do we get our PDF sent? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when it's been edited. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm te I'm teasing. I'm teasing. But no, look, no, seriously. I mean, it, I can't tell you how much of a joy it was to be able to to read the, the first volume and um, and just learn so many different things. And I know you guys didn't set out to uh you know bust myths and stuff like that but i mean it just happened that way because as we know sure. um the, the the four they're not the best historians within the, their careers and beetle career wouldn't you say well right you know they don't do what we do which is sit around and listen to the stuff over and over and try and figure right. out how it was done because they were there they know how it was done and they move on to the next thing right um, right so they're not historians plus um, you know, they're as fallible as the rest of us are in terms of memory, especially as they get older. So, right. you know, things that Paul says today are not necessarily as accurate as, you know, what we try to do when we're researching is we try to find information as close to the event, you know, his comments as close mm. to the event as possible mm. on the theory that those will be the most accurate. It's not necessarily true. You know, sometimes people close to an event have an agenda and they mm. might not want to say everything about something or they may want to put it in a, a, a way that puts it in a light that isn't, you know, absolutely 100 percent accurate. And then maybe 10 years later when they're talking about it, it may become mm. more accurate. So, you know, it's it's constantly weighing, you know, different quotes about the same thing and trying right. to figure out what's the most accurate. It's, it's difficult. You know, we have debates about it all the time. 
Um, mm. So, you know, we, we're just sort of doing our best to get to the truth, and mm. that's all you can do. Dare, that's all you can do. Dare we yeah. ask where uh, you think Volume 3 starts and ends or is it too soon um it'll well, start, I mean, we... <laughs> no, it'll start in 1980 uh, and um the way we're thinking now um it probably will go to um maybe just before the 89 tour kicks off because mm. if we if we get onto the tour then we have to do the whole tour right. you know right, right. um and a tour, you know, while we cover them because they're in his life and they're what he does and all that, tours are not necessarily the most exciting reading and they don't necessarily give you a, anything like a cliffhanger ending right. or anything like that. So we may start and we may end before the tour or else we have to go all the way into 1990s. So we'll see. Yeah. And, and, and how many times, how many reviews can you read of the same set list that was great every night? <laughs> yeah. And go through it. That, that reviews where the, where the editors have called it. Oh, Paul has a new band on yeah. the run. You know? <laughs> right. Oh, you got that book for this pretty of much. Course. <laughs> right. But, right. But, but, but you, the way you guys have structured it, I mean, volume one, right, starts at the low point and it ends at such a high. Mm. And then we, with well, volume two coming up, you, we're, we're still at this high, but then we're kind of, in a way, not spoiling anything. We're ending at a low. And, and in the 1980s, there's really actually kind of two lows because then with volume three, you can almost start where volume one started. It was kind of almost like at a low mm. and, then, and then ending at a high in a way. Right, right. Um, you know, it depends how you define a low. I mean, <clears throat> Paul himself was apparently not happy with back to the egg um i personally love back to the egg so yeah, i, I think he ended on a high <laughs> although you know we, we we i say ending with back to the egg but the fact is that he recorded mccartney 2 in the summer of 79 after back right. to the egg mm -hmm. and so that's in volume two as well even though the record hadn't mm. come out yet um right right so yeah but you know and he and he has a, a very successful little British tour at the end of '79, um, and then he's about to tour Japan. And I'll just leave it there. <laughs> there you go. There you go for, for volume yeah. two. Uh, in yeah. terms of little kind of newsworthy items here, before we dive into a topic at hand, um, nothing really pressing. Other than, do we know any more about Man on the Run, uh, the documentary that we think maybe is coming out at the end of this year, right? Um, that is the last I heard end yeah. of the year. Um, but who knows, you know, productions often go into overtime and, um, it, 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 it may not be out by the end of the year, but it's, it, they haven't announced anything other no. than end of 24. Right. And the gotcha, only other thing gotcha. really is that Paul has been dropping uh, a couple of things. Well, we talked about it last week. Um, and actually, Adrian and I messaged about it, these kind of BBC recording, bootleg recordings of the uh, some of the Wings tours that were just being dropped for copyright dump reasons. Yeah. Um, they're not really BBC recordings. I mean, I don't think right. they, I don't think that show was ever broadcast on. The no, BBC. I didn't think it was. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, they had recorded that show professionally and mm. there is an acetate of it around that had been bootlegged all the members of wings were given it all the members of brinsley schwartz who were second bill to them on that right. tour were given it um and and so there are copies around and uh, it could have could have come from anywhere because it, it has been out on bootleg whether that's a a copyright thing i mean adrian's theory uh, maybe maybe he had thought of it differently when he spoke to you but when we spoke about it his feeling was that you know sometimes youtube just puts things on people's pages that seem thematic mm. that isn't necessarily the person whose page it is putting it on um and so he thought that might be one reason that that sheffield concert was on it and wasn't just, even the the best quality of that no it was not I mean, no there, there are better no. bootlegs out of it well, yeah, I mean, the, well, the, the Newcastle, the, the Newcastle uh, show is, yeah. is a, oh, New, you know, was it Newcastle yeah. or, yes, or Newcastle. Oh, yeah, Newcastle, it was Newcastle. Newcastle. I mean, the, the, the CD from the big barn bed box 
you know, mm-hmm. big barn, you know, that means sounded 10 times better than, than what we got uh, right. with this dump. Right. So it's right. kind of surprising in that, in that sense. Um, speaking of the, you know, one last thing about the book, uh, I know, I know you guys know that MP, MPL did receive, you know, volume one with the success of volume one and then going into volume two. I mean, any words with any more, um, any contributions from MPL now going forward, or are you guys just now still now just it's, it's this is on your own and uh, no help from them at all? We're still on our own. Um, yeah. We haven't approached them again. Um, you know, we approached them at the beginning of volume right. one. Um, right. We never approached them when we started volume two because we figure, you know, they know we're here. If they liked volume one, maybe they'll volunteer to be right. involved, but. Um, they haven't, and uh, but they also again are not stopping us. They're they're not doing anything to get in our right. way. When people yeah. go to Paul and say, "Can we talk? Do you mind if we talk to these guys?" He's been mm-hmm. saying, "Yeah, sure, go ahead." Right. Um, so, yeah. you know, we're happy for that because he could say, right. "You know, I'd rather you didn't," and right. he hasn't. So, uh, you know, I I I have to think that if he's read the book at all. Um, you know, there are obviously some stories in there that maybe he would have preferred weren't or, right. you know, whatever. But I think he has to look at it and say, OK, they really are treating my work with respect. And, you know, they're not trashing things. They're not offering even we're not even offering our own opinion about no. things. They quote reviews. Right. Um, you know, and, and that, it, that is one thing that came up, like in the 910 review, the, the reviewer said, you know, I, I don't understand why Alan Cozen was a, a music critic for 40 years. Why is he not expressing an opinion? And the thing is that what we're trying to do is show the opinions of the time. So the fact that Ram is now considered one of his great albums um, right. is kind of irrelevant to us because at the time it took a lot of criticism and we're printing the criticism. We're also printing positive reviews if we find them. But what I think, where I think my own critical view comes out is that if I describe a track like Backseat of My Car or Little Lamb mm-hmm. Dragonfly or some of the songs that I, I think are just incredible, I kind of think that it comes out in the description that I think it's incredible because what I'm basically saying is, okay, this is what McCartney's doing. This is what's unusual about it. And this is Mm. why it works. (laughs) You know, Mm. that's kind of music criticism in a way. It's maybe sneaky music criticism, but But I can't help myself. It's what I do. (laughs) You guys have written a book like, you know, as a a proper historian, you're, you're, you've left yourself out of it and you're letting the history tell the story. Speak for itself. Really? Yeah. 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 And that was largely Adrian's idea. I mean, I left to my own devices. I would be, I would be, you know, doing opinions right and left because it's, you know, like I say, what I do. Right. Um, but, you know, the, the fact that in, in a way that the two of us are so different in, in so many mm. ways, I mean, British and American, he's 43 years old, I'm 69, um, right. you know, so I lived through it and he grew up with it as the background of his right. growing up, you know, it, it already was there. He was, you know, taking it in. Um he didn't want criticism. I would have, you know, all that, all these things that we sort of have negotiated, I think have made it a much stronger project and have made yeah. it a really great collaboration. I mean, we debate stuff all the time, right. but we don't fight, you know, we don't have personal fights. We, you know, we get along really well. I mean, I really admire Adrian and, and I think it's mutual. Um, but you know, we're, we've just become really good friends mm. doing this. And, mm. uh, and I'm, mm. I'm really grateful for the collaboration. It's because collaboration's tough and I've never, right. I've never collaborated on writing before, you know, I've always been a solo right. practitioner. So, right. uh, and doing it internationally <laughs> also. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah, so it's been, it's I've, been good. I've, yeah, I've come to the conclusion doing after doing this show now for whatever eight years or whatever. It's just like, 
you know, I, I try to be positive and negative at the same time, you know, where I'll poo poo on something, but I won't kick it, you know, while it's down, you know, it's like off the ground is not my favorite album, but I'm just not going to continue to just bash it and bash it when it's, it's a, it could be somebody else's favorite album, you know, yeah. someone like, I feel like, who am I to bash this album when I don't like it, but, but that doesn't mean it's not going to have its fans. There's yeah. another thing that um, I've discovered, <laughs> excuse me, <clears throat> in the process of doing this is that in the past, when I've listened to Paul's stuff, except for the stuff that I reviewed for the Times, so we're talking about starting like 89 or so, um, right. I basically, you know, put them on and listened to them, maybe listened to them a few times, maybe periodically pulled them out and listened to them. But right. I wasn't really doing really deep analytical listening. And for this project, we were doing deep analytical listening for every single track, all the outtakes we could find of the track, um, going through all the paperwork to try and see how the track was made. And it's given me a lot of respect for stuff that I – before writing the book really didn't like much. I mean, I was not a fan of wildlife. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say that wildlife is the greatest album ever made, but I have a lot more respect for wildlife now that I have sort of walked through the process of putting it together. You know, gotcha. there are still some things that seem a little bit slate of hand, you know, like uh, mumbo, you know, and take it, Tony, and, you know, right. the jam kind of sound, and it sort of gives the impression, and they basically would say in interviews that, like, this was live in the studio, but it, it kind of wasn't live. If you if you listen to all the parts being played, there were more parts being played than there were members of Wings, so it was <laughs> live in the studio, you know, right. and as we went through the paperwork, we saw exactly what they did and what was added when and how, what was edited, um, you know. So, and and I actually have more respect for the real story than for the myth, you know. Mm. So, right. you know, we basically told what happened, but I ended up coming out of that liking wildlife a lot more than I had when I went into it, especially side two, actually, you know, yeah. all the ballads, those, those are actually some right. pretty nice songs, um, you know, but you get the impression overall, partly because of side one and mm. the, you know, the intention of being sort of rocky and rough you get the impression that it's a really sloppy album, but it's not really that sloppy an mm. album, especially side two. So, right. Yeah, I agree. Know. I agree. Yeah. So, you know, getting on with our, with our main topic here, like I said, this is going to be a new series uh, featuring the iconic tracks or songs, you know, throughout McCartney's career. So, you know, going in order, obviously starting with the, 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 the big one from the McCartney album, which, you know, maybe I'm amazed. I mean, if we're going to start, I guess we should start. What start better place to start? With, uh, with the mother of them all. Um, you know, mm -hmm. but but before we get in the track, I guess I mean, guess it's it's important to also uh, kind of understand um, where he was coming from before the song was conceived or or written or recorded. I mean, as we know, we, we we've heard the story from from Paul hundreds of times, where you know we, he got the news from 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 John. He wanted to you know to break up the Beatles, but we didn't want to say anything, and um, you know he was kept told to kept to keep his mouth shut. Paul and Linda, they go to their, their Hyde Park uh, home and they're there for months while Paul is dealing with his depression and, and Linda bringing him back up. Um, the, the song out of that um, really is, is thankfully from Linda, right? I mean, if it wasn't for really Linda, you know, doing these things, helping Paul get out of this depression, we probably would never have this masterpiece of a song. Yeah, absolutely. Um, he, he was actually only there for a month or less. Um, he got there right. October 22nd and, and he was back um, in relatively early November because it started snowing and they had a baby and, you know, right. and a ramshackle house. And yeah, it, with like no running um, water. So they weren't going to stay there. <laughs> yeah. So they, they came back yeah. more quickly than we tend to think because of Thank the you. way he yeah. tells the story. 
Um, right. When he came back, uh, you, even before he left, he had arranged to borrow this four-track Studer deck from EMI and have it set up in his music room. And he was going to record something. It could have been an album. It could have been a bunch of demos. He wasn't totally sure what it was going to be. I mean, basically, he was hedging his bets. If he liked it, he was going to put it out. And if he wasn't crazy about it, it was go going to go on the shelf of demos. Um, and he started working on this. And and But what did he have in terms of new stuff originally? Right. The lovely Linda, and that would be something. Well, the lovely Linda is like half a verse of a song <laughs> and he even said in the self-interview press release that you know this is a this is like a trailer for a movie i'll i'll finish it and do it again sometime right. he never did that would be something is uh you know, it's also uh not much of a song it's kind of a little blues riff and you know a light lyric and those are the only two things he came back from scotland with so mm. What is he doing for the rest of the album? Um, he's doing some jams, which became things like Mama Miss America and Ooh You and, and other things. But otherwise, you know, he's looking backwards. He's getting Teddy Boy from the Beatle days. Right. Glasses. Um, he's going all the way back to Hottest Sun, yep. which was like 1958. Sun, right. And Suicide, right. you had a little bit of Suicide that we get, you know. Um, was like one of his first songs. Um, so he's he's sort of pillaging his unfinished back catalog. But then, you know, he had he had the chords for Maybe I'm Amazed. He didn't really have a lyric. He just had the idea for the song. And with a lot of, with about as much of the album as he could do at home already done, <clears throat> He and Linda went sort of, you know, driving around the South. Uh, Linda was looking for another property. Um, she loved it up in Scotland. And they had this nice place on Cavendish Avenue in London, you know, basically walking distance from Abbey Road. But, um, but she wanted a place in the South of England that would be more of a, you know, more of like John's Tittenhurst Park, you know, just like a, mm. like a, a the mansion on grounds, plenty of room for horses, all that stuff that, you know, uh, we, we've seen the letters that she wrote to, well, well, they're quoted in the book. You've seen them too. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> real estate people. <laughs> um, and they're looking. And so they went for a drive around the South, you know, partly just as a getaway and partly to look at, you know, at places that they would consider or, or cities, towns they'd consider or whatever. And, and, while doing that, you know, he sort of finished up Maybe I'm Amazed and went mm. into the studio. Um, right. He had already started doing things in in the studio because I think he realized he was about at the end of what he could do at home. You know, he didn't have a mixer. He didn't have right. video meters, you know. Uh, <laughs> and I, I think he, after doing most of the album that way he decided you know i want i want to do this more in the manner to which i'm accustomed right and he there, right because yeah. well, i mean not to interrupt sorry but because there is no evidence of him doing any kind of demo whatsoever of maybe i'm amazed no nope. during those home nope. sessions nope he just walked into the studio and uh, i think it was was it um february february 15. yeah and that was at yeah. emi Oh, no and suit on him. Just sat yeah. down and did it, and you know, right. track by track, the whole thing in one day. And right, uh, you, you know, you got upon the return to London. Paul was keen to get to his latest work on tape, and since he had already booked EMI Studios, he bypassed the home demo stage. Maybe I'm amazed. Was recorded in a single session on the evening of February 15. I mean, that's mm -hmm. kind of like, in a way, um, what was the, the bad finger, if come and get it, in a way, right? Where he just records this in, in one evening. You that know, oh, he actually he did that in an hour. In the morning before the session. Yeah, he, he did, did that yeah. in an hour. Right, yeah. He did that in an hour. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. You um, know, but, but with, an, with an engineer and with, yeah. you know, a board and 
you know, all the equipment he wanted. Um, there's a big difference between maybe I'm amazed and most of the other stuff on, on, right. on the McCartney album. Yes. You know, another exception is Karina Crore, which was another studio thing. And, you know, right. I mean, we're talking about maybe I'm amazed, so I won't go too much into Karina Crore. But, you know, with that one, I mean, he 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 sent he went out and bought a bow and arrow and he set up a campfire oh. and he and Linda would, you know, made animal noises and sped up the tape to make them sound more animally. And, you know, and this was just the day after seeing a documentary Right. About right. a Brazilian uh, Indian tribe um, that was very mm -hmm. sort of non gregarious. And uh, it was called the tribe that hides from man. Um, they right. weren't even friendly with the other tribes around. Right. Them. No. Yeah. I found uh, a bit. You can, you can find a bit of a, an expert from it on YouTube, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I've uh, seen the whole thing, actually. It's, it's a really yeah, fascinating got, documentary, yeah. and, you right. know, and it has music, uh, you know, mostly Western music. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you can see this is the thing about Paul. And it's one of the things that has come through both volumes is that he's he's kind of like an idea sponge. You know, he'll see something. It could be anything. And you never know what is going to trigger an idea for him that is right. going to become a song, you know? Right. So there was that one and that one's a little bit out there. You know, I think a lot of people probably skip that track on the album, although it's got great stuff in it. Yeah. No, no, no. That's, I play that every time. Oh, that's we one of know. My favorite. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> but maybe I'm amazed is really, you know, the, right. uh, to me and, and most people, I, I'm sure, is really the heart of that yeah. album, you know. Correct. It, Correct. And we'll get to that part, you know, a little later. But um, you got here, he played every single instrument, did all the vocals with one small contribution from Linda. But it was a song. Maybe I'm amazed he did the whole thing start to finish every instrument, bass, drum, guitars, uh, taped in EMI's Studio, studio 2, the large room where Beatles did most of the recordings. Uh, and then you, you talk about which, you know, the tracks, which, which track had which instrument on them, uh, which one had the vocals, backing vocals. I mean, it was, he ended up using all, it was an eight track, right? And you end up using all eight tracks uh, right. for this. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know. And, you know, and it's got three solos, which is unusual for him. Right. Um, right. There's, you know, a really interesting chord progression, uh, really interesting use of texture, like, you know, the organ at the very yeah. beginning. Right. You know, it's uh, I don't know that that track is just genius. Um, mm. it, it, and, a, it, and a fade it, in too, no less. Yeah. 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 <laughs> There's just so much uh, in it. It, it, it right. never gets old. <laughs> it's, you know, it's one of right. those. He had familiar company working with him. He had, you know, Phil McDonald, uh, engineer, and Alan Parsons as, as the assistant to, to Phil. So, I mean, people he did, you know, kind of know uh, working with him. This was like Aiden, and he said it was a hush hush project. He did have a different name, right? Uh, Billy Martin. For the, Billy Martin. Billy yeah. Martin. And while we're, uh, while we're yeah, talking very... side personnel, I just want to yeah. ask Alan a question because I just am about finished with Ken Womack's book on Mal Evans. And he's, I got up to this point right when kind of Mal had kind of really been working more with John and George and Ringo and Paul had kind of done his own thing. Mm -hmm. And Mal, because Mal and Paul were pretty tight there for a while, right. you know, in the heyday of the Beatles. And by this point when he's recording McCartney, you know, he had gone, gone to Scotland. All of a sudden, you know, Mal gets a, uh, a call from Paul saying, can you bring this, you know, four track over to my house? And that's, that, that's according to Ken Womack. Did you guys, was it was it Mal, the one who brought over the the, um, the four track recorder to Cavendish that you know of? I thought it was um, Eddie Klein and um, another guy. But, uh, you know, if Mal says that he did it, he, he very well might have. And they, they might have come over to set it up. You know, yeah, um, <clears throat> because they were technical guys. They weren't ne weren't necessarily there to drag equipment, um, but they were there to set it up for him so that it, you know, it, it was tested and worked by the time he got back from Scotland and wanted to start recording. Um, and how long did actually he record at home? You know, he's all, oh, he recorded these at, like before he actually went. I mean, he went in in February. How long was he recording this at home? All these all this material. Pretty much, um, you know, the second half of December, I think, really. 
Mm. Um, and he might have done some things in January. I, I, I think the last thing he might have done is every night. And then he was right. running into problems with, you know, a buzz and all that. And I think he just maybe had enough. And, mm. you know, right. I don't want to I don't want to be the engineer, too, anymore. Um, <laughs> right. You know, but that's the great thing. That's the great thing of your book um, is, you know, we, 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 we assume that he's him and he and Linda and the, and, and the kids are in at High Park for for months, uh, you know, because and then all of a sudden this the album pops up. I mean, we don't really realize that he was like you said, he was only there for maybe a month and comes back and then he's quietly doing these home demos. And then, you know, as we know, got you know, goes goes back into, in, you know, an EMI as a different name and, and slowly, you know, starts to record these tracks professionally. Right. Right. Yeah. Only, only, you know, if only a few of the tracks. Um, I mean, right. the, the ones he recorded at home pretty much are as he recorded them on the album. I, I don't even know that he did too much in the way of overdubbing onto those. There might have been one or two he added something to, but um, but mostly that's how they were. And the new stuff at EMI was just new stuff at EMI that right. was added to the batch. Um, mm -hmm. And so in a way you listen to the album and they, okay, there's kind of a disparity between that would be something. And, you know, maybe I'm amazed, <laughs> but <laughs> in a way, you, you know, in a way it, I always thought it all hung together. I mean, Right. Because the story that had always come out, I mean, it's really only a, a bit later that we began to realize what was done at EMI and what was done at home and, and all mm -hmm. of that. The, the, the impression that you got originally when it came out was that this is an album he recorded on his own at home. And OK, so mm -hmm. you have a certain expectation for a recorded at home album, you know, right. different than a recorded at Abbey Road album. Um, so, you know, you just sort of accepted it as kind of homespun, although a lot of the reviews thought it was too homespun, you know, <laughs> and that right. was, you know, he, he always reacted to reviews in a way, you know, this was too homespun. So, okay. With Ram, we're going to be really careful. We're going to get an orchestra in, we're going to, you know, record it in a studio. It's going to be with studio musicians, and then what happens? He's criticized for being too slick. Yeah. I, I think that right. I think the public at large and critics at the time just couldn't wrap their heads around the fact that a guy detached himself from you know a bad situation and locked it down with his family just to figure himself out for a little while. You mm -hmm. know, it wasn't going to be some grandiose Abbey Roadside Two thing, or even Let It Be. You know, I mean, even even though maybe I'm amazed, I think is as good as Let It Be. Mm. Um, I think that's the problem with the fans and the critics. They were expecting that caliber of stuff, and he just came out with a nice, organic, quiet, rustic album, and people were like, "Well, what is this?" You know, right? Yeah, but I mean, I mean, I liked I liked this one when it came out. Uh, it was because everyone was sort of curious. Okay, what's Paul going to do? You know, mm. what's his first album going to be? It's you know, right? And. Um, I thought it was okay, you know, um, and not just because maybe I'm amazed, although that obviously was the, the center of gravity, but I, I kind of liked it all. And um, yeah, I think it's difficult for us to understand how you can go from being a Beatle to right. having the crisis of confidence that he had, you know, and in a certain way, it was difficult for Linda too. And, and it's a good thing because Linda told him all the stuff that any of us would have told him, wait a minute, right. <laughs> you know, you're one of the world's great songwriters. You're one of the world's great right. faces. You're one of the world's great vocalists. What are you upset right. about? You know, right. you know, and you've done recordings on your own, you know, you did the bad finger thing, you, you know, come and get it. You've, there, there are certain Beatles tracks that are, you know, all or mostly you. What's the big deal? So you just go on. But for him, you know, it, it, it's hard for us, I think, to realize that for him, um, the loss of the group, you know, uh, Mark Lucid and I always have to, you know, have had this 
argument, and I think it applies more to the early Beatles than the late Beatles. But when I wrote um, Alan Williams's obit in the Times, um, I got a call from Mark saying, you know, you say they're a band, but they were a group. So, well, okay, Mark, you know, that is a, a, a word that we use interchangeably here. But I think what Mark really meant was that it was a group as in it was a gang. You know, the mm. Beatles were his gang and they had been his gang from a very early age and for his entire adult life. So it wasn't just that, okay, your group's gone, but you're a great musician, you just carry on. It's like your whole social cloud <laughs> has evaporated. You know, everybody who was your, cl your closest friends in the world are now sort of arrayed against you because you don't want Alan Klein to be your manager you know, mm. and that has to have been really hard for him. You know, that's a great kind of breakdown between the two words, you know, band and group, because a band is great. It's just musicians. Right. But as to you point out, it's more than just being in a band. It was everything. It was his, as you said, it was his social life. It was his everything. So yeah. it wasn't just a band ending. It was a way of life, too. Yeah. And if you consider as well, you know, there's a quote uh, I included in the book um, from John Kurlander, who was one of the engineers they worked with. Um, <clears throat> and uh, John went on to be a classical producer for EMI and classical music is mostly what I covered at the time. So um, I went to a session he did in Philadelphia with the Philadelphia Orchestra. And then we went to lunch and mm. I started to talk to him about the Beatles. And he said, here's the thing about the Beatles. Individually, they were all the greatest guys. You would have an incredible time with right. any of them. Two of them together, it was still together, pretty right. <laughs> Three of them, it got a right. little bit dicey. If you were in the room with all four of them, they were the most horrible people in the world. And it didn't matter what your relationship with each of them was. You were <laughs> not them. So mm -hmm. there was this very definite, you know, them versus everybody else that probably was forged during the Beatlemania period when they were stuck in the back of a truck or, you know, locked in a hotel room and, you know, unable to do very much. You know, there was the fact that there was the world out there and there was the four of them. So, you know, right. factor that into the personality aspect as well and how the split of the Beatles has to have affected Paul. Right, so, right. Yeah, right, which makes this journey of a track to bring it full circle back to maybe I'm amazed pretty mm -hmm. remarkable because yeah. um, it's still very in the early throes of the yeah. breakup and everything. And right. he's found, you know, find, you know, like a light that he can kind of, you know, see on. OK, there's yeah. a light at the end of the tunnel. I can get through this. Right. And here's this. I'm going to write this amazing song. Well, you know, yeah. So let's break that down then in, on the tracks here, because then, on, you know, on one track we got Paul begins with piano and lead vocal. So on that's just one track. Let's talk about the piano. I mean, this is like the, the, the piano ballad from Paul. I mean, people are going to remember this as, as one of his greatest vocal performances and maybe one of his best uh, tracks uh, for his piano playing as well. Yeah. I mean, it's not flashy piano playing. It, it's, um, right. it's, you know, it does what it needs to do to accompany mm -hmm the vocal without right. stealing attention from it. Um, right. But it's, you know, it's very solid. It's, uh, <clears throat> Paul has, you know, in, 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 in purely musical terms, he has an incredible amount of taste and he knows when to play that kind of straightforward piano line that, you know, has a very full warm sound. Um, as as you say, it, it 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 almost is as important as the vocal um, right. in terms of the texture of the song, um, you know. And there are so many different things that you can do. He he seems to always come up with the right way to do it. And and certainly, and maybe I'm amazed. I mean, you can't right. argue with what he did. Right. So that was track one and two. Track three, then um, uh, he brings in the drums, which again, you know, as as someone who loved playing drums as well, 
um, I think does does a fantastic job with 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 drums on this, and then uh, bass on track four. You you got backing vocals on uh, track five, and then you know track six. I think then um, no track no track four was bass. So again, you know bass he he, he which is his his his, his signature um, instrument kind of plays a second fiddle in a way to I think one or third fiddle even if, if you include the the piano and and the, his guitar solos that he right. performs on this track mm -hmm. in a way so in a way i mean he's also showing off his his guitar playing skills which i think i know we get uh, sometimes we get into a debate whether or not the live version with jimmy playing guitar is better than the studio version with Paul. well i'll touch on that in a minute but i want to let alan yeah. answer but i want to yeah. ask him a question about yeah. the evolution but but yeah. con continue yeah. go, Tom. go ahead but I'm saying, I mean, it, it, so, I mean, that bass kind of almost is secondary to all these other instruments. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. You, you know, the, it's not one of his, not one of his fancier bass lines. Um, right, right. So, and, yeah. Um, are there any more tracks that you have to, that are, you have to go through? Well, I mean, no, I mean, that's, I mean, we, that, I mean, because then the rest are just backing vocals. All right. So and you have it uh, on the arrangement. Okay. Now we're talking about the studio, but I, Maybe I'm amazed has a great kind of evolution in terms of being played live from its original gestation, you know, obviously the studio recording, and then you hear those early Wings versions of it. It's very different than what ends up being out on Wings Over America. So he was trying to polish it up a little bit, make it more of a, a big stage number that it became, obviously, iconically when it was released as a single in 77. Um, just curious about your thoughts, Alan. Um you know, obviously he worked it into early wing set list, but you know, and I, I'm not every set list. I don't. Was it played on the university tour? I don't think so. No. No. So um, I think maybe the, I guess the first European tour is where it makes its makes its appearance. I guess. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think on the university tour he didn't uh, didn't have a piano didn't had, have any piano stuff, did he? I don't think so. No, no I, I think, think the song for a lot of times he just goes into the song. There's no big kind of piano. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. intro to it it kind of just goes right into it and there's no big grand finale kind mm -hmm. of fading out kind of like the record so I was just curious i'm just it would be interesting to see how where paul decided to say i'm going to make this song a little bit more flashy for a for live performances than than it is on the studio record which re listen it has its fans tom is on is on the record many times for saying how he prefers the studio version over the live how do you feel alan i think i prefer the studio version too um but I don't dislike the live one. Um, right. I like the studio version because it's all him, because mm -hmm. it's almost, um, you know, to a degree, almost being composed there. I mean, he went in with the song and it's a finished song. But for instance, those guitar solos, I don't think he had premeditated necessarily. I think those were on the spur of the moment in the session. Um, and... There's just you know something about the fact that it's such an incredible track and it's all him um, is just very impressive to me. Uh, the live one, brilliant as it is, is a band where Paul has said, "Okay, Jimmy, this is what you play," you know, mm -hmm. and Jimmy was uh, somewhat somewhat better about that than Henry had been. Um, right. but, but Jimmy had his moments too. <laughs> Of, you know, right. of rebellion. Well, even when we had, yeah, even when we had Lauren LJ on, he we, we talked about that, that that exact same thing, and he said, "Well, yeah, I mean, the, the structure of the of those solos are the same, but he was able also able to fit in a couple different little, you know, chords here and here and sure. there. So it yeah. didn't have to be exact science all the time." Right. Right. Yeah, I guess Paul, you know, Paul allowed a little bit of leeway, but generally right. speaking, the shape of the yeah. solo was what he wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's sort of interesting because Paul approaches it, uh, these things, almost more like a classical composer than like a rock composer. I mean, you know, mm. if you're if you're um, Felix Papillardi and you're writing for Mountain, you know, Leslie West is going to play whatever the hell he wants to play, you know, <laughs> but you're writing it for Wings and you're Paul and it's, um, OK, this is my idea of the solo and this is what I want you to play. And that was where he and Henry came to grief so many times. And finally, Henry left over that. Um, right. But, you know, in the one time that he that, that he allowed Henry to do what he wanted to do was my love. 
And that was a brilliant solo. So even right. and even Paul admitted, and um, when the reviews came out, you know, almost every single review focused on the solo as 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 mm. being great. So, right. um, yeah. you know, in a way, I, you know, you sort of wish that he could have let a little more loose. But on the other hand, you know, you listen to something like Maybe I'm Amazed, and you know that like this is a guy who knows what he wants right. for that right. composition. So. Right. Absolutely, absolutely, I agree. Uh, let's let's switch to, to to the lyrics because I, I I'm fascinated when when you think of this is here's somebody that didn't do a demo for this track, just goes in that we know and, of and does it, that I, know, yeah right? that we know of right and and just you know this this track just appears in in one session. I it's, it's fascinating to me. I mean, obviously he's probably got the lyrics written down on a sheet. He's he's going over them uh, while he does the song, but. But lyrically, I mean, it's not that much, but but you feel the sense of of the power that he has with his relationship with with Linda in in the lyrics, especially I love the, you know, baby, I'm a man. Maybe I'm a lonely man who's in the middle of something that he doesn't really understand that bit, too, for me. And then the way he sings that um, just really is one of the standouts lyrically for mm -hmm. for the track. I mean, it was, uh, I mean, how do you feel about it lyrically? Yeah, I think it's it, it's. It's one of his strongest lyrics, certainly for his early stuff um, mm -hmm. and for really a, a lot of his catalog, because, you know, with with, with Paul, sometimes with, he he has said he doesn't really care as much about lyrics as music. Right. Um, and so you have songs that have lyrics like bit, bop, bit, bop, bam, right. you know, right. Um, right. or one, two, three, four, five, let's go for a drive. You know, I've, I've always right. been sort of against right. this counting songs. I don't think counting counts as a lyric. You know, you can do it once and he already did it with all together now. With all together now, right. <laughs> it's a rare mo it's a rare yeah. song for him to talk about himself so personally because he's so Absolutely. like taking a page out of Lennon. Like you know, whereas Paul's very comfortable writing about paperback writers and right. you know Well we'll yeah, but you things got like an that. interesting point. You got an interesting point like that. And he does we'll mention that because he does kind of talk about that in the lyrics book as well to where he in a way he can also he'll write it in a way where it doesn't necessarily mean him it can mean anybody right. really it could but obviously yeah. he's yeah. pretty raw emotionally here right now and it's right. all over the song and yeah. in, in the lyrics right. to your right. point here yeah. in it. you know right. so and i love her can be about jane or it could not be about jane you know but right. Right. but maybe i'm amazed given the history given the circumstances you know, you got to think that even if he were to deny that it was about Linda, which he hasn't done, um, right. you would still think, OK, OK, you know, she did sort of hang him on a line and she did, you know, pull him out right. of time. Uh, right. He was a lonely man in the middle of something that he didn't really understand. Now, in the context of this song, uh, uh, if uh, let's say a love song, um, where you're not necessarily thinking about it being Paul or the personality right. of the writer, you see a line like maybe I'm a lonely man who's in the middle of something I, that he doesn't really understand. You could just take that as, yeah, you know, falling in love is just such a, you know, mysterious thing and all that. Mm -hmm. But I think that we know that he's, he's also talking about his situation with regard to right. the Beatles, with regard to his, you know, starting his nascent solo career um, and, and and everything. He's in the middle of something that he doesn't really understand, and he's still picking his way through it. And so he's being really very honest here, but he's doing it in the context of a love song where it could mean a number of different things. Right, right. Um, yeah, in the book, in the lyrics book also, he, he says, though the song written immediately after the Beatles breakup, it was somehow included under the Lennon-McCartney rubric, where it doesn't belong. Uh, it was one of my first songs. It's, it's funny how he, he feels that way. I don't understand why he would feel that uh, way. Is that ever credited Lennon-McCartney? I don't think so. No, 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 no. I've never seen it credited as Lennon-McCartney. So well, this I is why I say that, that memories right. are as valuable for former right. Beatles as it is for us. Right. Maybe yeah. he's confusing so that with Give Peace a yeah. Chance, which is. Right. Yes, uh, that's right. Yes, 
that's true. That's true. Uh, then he goes on here. While it's true that Linda is the person I'm addressing, it is also true that I'm dealing in fiction. Uh, starting with myself, the characters who appear in my songs are imagined. I, can, I can't state that often enough. I know that in some quarters, uh, it's felt you can't write about gay people unless you're gay or about Asian Americans unless you're Asian Americans. Mm -hmm. I think that's silly. Uh, that's like saying that because James Joyce wasn't Jewish, uh, he uh, shouldn't uh, have written uh, about uh, Leopold uh, Bloom. So, you know, he, he doesn't really, I mean, he gets into just little bits, I, I, you know, of the song. He doesn't really, t in a way, talk a lot about, the, you know, putting the song together and a lot of these lyric, you know, the songs right. that he, you know, how much did you get from this um, um, after, you know, because you, because your book was supposed to come out. I mean, you actually postponed uh, the book because of the, you know, the lyrics book. <laughs> Uh, yeah. What were your thoughts on the on the lyrics book? Did you get, were you able to take anything away from them, away from it? Um, <clears throat> there may be a couple of comments that we quote, um, but generally speaking, I'm not sure how to how to diplomatically put this. I mean, I'm I'm happy to have the lyrics book. I'm happy to have anything he writes or dictates or is interviewed for or whatever and puts out right but i can't say i got an awful lot about it uh, from it because um you know the songs that we covered that are in the lyrics book we had researched really thoroughly um and so i don't believe there were any cases where we looked in the lyrics book and and said wow we totally missed it what we did do is we'd say well Okay, he's saying in the lyrics book that he named took the name for Jet from a horse, and he horse, shows the picture right. of the horse, but that horse was born after he wrote Jet, and we have interviews from the time where he talks about Jet being a puppy and how it was the runt of the litter, and they gave them all away, and we even know the other names of the puppies in the litter. One was called Basker Menon, or um, <laughs> <laughs> what was it? Um, uh, the the U.S. head. I, I it was someone I Al, actually Alan, not Alan Livingston. Um, no, no, no. Brown Megs. Oh, uh, yeah. So. You know, uh, we tend to believe that it really was really about the puppy. Um, and now, you know, whether he got the name from a puppy or a horse is not a huge, important matter. But, you know, we're reading this book as a source of information and we're saying, OK, but that's not right. And also, I believe he repeated the story of george martin taking live and let die to right yeah the producers right, yeah. you know and he knew better than that right. and that was george martin's story that he adopted and uh so things like that i found kind of disappointing but on the other hand not because he's not a historian and he doesn't have to get it right it's his life he can he can say what he wants you know yeah he could say you know if he wanted he could say, you know, uh, okay, you may think this is about Linda, but I had already met Nancy. Mm. <laughs> and a totally ahistorical, you know, but if that's what he wanted to say, he could say it. And, right. you know, who's, who's going to argue except, well, we will. But, right. you know, <laughs> but, you know um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I see, you know, how he he says and wants to say that, you know, you have to understand that all the people in these songs are imagined people. I think in the right. case of maybe I'm amazed, you know, there's a certain degree to which Paul, the professional songwriter writing a love song has in mind that it should be a song that anybody could sing about the person they love and in that sense, it has to be an imagined person because, you know, it, it can't be that personal about Linda. But, you know, look at the lyrics, look at the circumstances, right. look at the situation. You know, I think you kind of have to see that this is a very personal song for him and the fact that given everything else on the album that he gave such a super performance of this song yes. and had Linda do some backing vocals on it. 
you know, I think he knew what Linda had done for him, you know, to get him to the point where he could record a song like Maybe I'm Amazed when he was in such bad shape. Mm -hmm. And I think there really is a a sense of gratitude that comes through the song. You know, it doesn't sit here and say, I'm so grateful for you, but it does say, you know, you're the only woman who could ever help me, you know, um, you know, and uh, yeah. I'm am- amazed at the way I really need you. Because let's face it, you know, Paul had been through a lot of women and none of them had really made him feel he needed them necessarily. Right. You know, Linda was a, a big difference, you know. And as as Linda says, you know, they had their fights like everybody else, you know, and she definitely found the situation up in Scotland a bit frustrating. You know, Mm -hmm. we have a quote in the book, I think, where she even says, you know, look, I'm a mother with a young baby and, uh, you know, and Heather was was older, but, but she was still a little kid. And she's in this house and she's got, and I've got a husband who doesn't want to get out of bed and just wants a drink. And, you you know, some of her frustration comes out in quotes like that, you know? And so in a way, Linda is also fighting for her life here, you know? Right. Just married this guy like nine months earlier. Nine months months earlier, right? You know, settling down, coming over from England, you know, America, whole new lifestyle. Yeah. 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 You know, and she also in a way, you know, like I said, you know, if all of us look at the Beatles and we, we, you know, you break up and, uh, you know, and you're Paul McCartney. Well, you know, why is it a problem? Linda came to it with some of the same views that we would have had. You know, there's another quote in the book where Paul is complaining about the horrible situation and she said, well, what are you complaining about? You guys are the princes of the world, right. you know? And it was only after sort of being there for a while that she realized that being princes of the world meant that like everybody who could suck something out of them did or tried, yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah, right. And that, you True. know, that was why they were the, the four, you know, impenetrable, you know, quartet Mm. that if you were someone who wasn't one of them, you found them horrible to be with. Maybe George Martin didn't, you know, (laughs) but, uh, or or Brian or Brian, Uh, right. You know, even Brian, you know, you know, they could be, uh, you know, Brian come into the studio and, and, uh, you know, make some suggestion and have John say to him, well, you know, Brian, why don't you see to the accounts, you know? Right. (laughs) So. Right, Epi, Epi, good old Epi. Um, let's move on. Uh, not released as a single, um, even though a promotional video was made right. uh, for this to help promote the, the album, I guess, mm-hmm. uh, rather than the song as a single. Mm. Um, let's talk about not being a single potential as a single. Do you think this would have done well as a single? Was it ever even considered, Alan? No, because he didn't think that you took singles off albums at that point. You know, even as late as Band on the Run, he had to be argued with, you know, first to put Helen Wheels on the U.S. version. Right, um, right. And, and then to take Band on the Run and Jet and, you know, off as, as singles. You know, Al Corey from Capitol had to, you know, sit him down and say, listen, you know, when we did it with Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon... <laughs> which was a good choice because Paul loved Dark Side of the Moon and he sure loved did. Pink Floyd. Uh, when we took it off Pink, off Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, it, it immediately sold another few hundred thousand and went up the charts again, you know, and Band on the Run went to number one three times because of the singles taken off it. So right. it took it took some time for Paul to think of having singles off albums as something you do. I mean, Although he, they had no problem doing that in America with Uncle Albert off Ram. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, I guess he looked at, you know, America slightly differently. Uh, you know, More and commercial. he put out Backseat of My Car in England as, as well. Mm. Um, it wasn't something he liked doing. And and I guess with maybe I'm amazed. I, I, I think it would have been great if he had because it, it would have, I really think, been a big hit. And it would have yeah. driven the sales of the album. 
yeah. a lot more. Right. And it would have given him probably the real shot in the arm that he needed given the early success of Harrison, Ringo, and Lennon and all the critical praise that they got right. on their albums. Yeah, right. but we all know that he dealt with confidence issues, you know, throughout, especially during, throughout the 70s. You know, right. you know, asking, you know, execs whether or not he should release this as a single or this right. as a single. But I'm know, just saying, but if that had come out as a love. single and pushed and promoted and done yeah. and taken off, maybe, yeah. he, you know, his early, maybe he's not looked at so critically harsh, harshly with Ram and McCartney and Wildlife if that right. single comes out. Right, right. You know, the thing yeah. about confidence issues, though, is that you sort of have to also understand that as difficult as it may be to understand why someone like Paul McCartney should have confidence issues, um, I think the fact that he has confidence issues is what drives him to do his best stuff. Um, you know, if you just if you just walk into the studio and you say, well, <clears throat> I'm Paul McCartney and I am the greatest thing since sliced bread and now we will hit record, you know, who knows what you'll do? You know, it, it is you 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 need confidence issues like it's 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 one of the sorry aspects of the human condition. You know, you need you need to think that you're not great in order to be great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's yeah. kind of, it's ironic, isn't it's, it? He and and that's the one of the things because I, I I know I tease you guys about the one of the authors that you quoted in the book, the person that we do dare not mention on the show. Oh, I think but, I know uh, who you mean. <laughs> yeah, and you might know, but but he also has these CDs out too. No, uh, no, don't, don't show it. Paul don't show them. Hook. I'm not. I'm not showing it. I'm not showing it. But but it's funny listening to that because he's got the the, the doodah band on there, and he talked about how he comes in as a producer. And then he just comes up to the grand piano and just starts playing them Hey Jude and say, hey, what do you think, guys? <laughs> you know, and, and it, it's pretty funny how they just talk about this guy who just, you know, whimsically, you know, comes on in and then just produces this album. And they all do what he says, you know, because they think they're just all in, in all. and all. And I think mm -hmm. he feels that sometimes um, when, when he's in a room like that and he can read a room. Uh, absolutely. So it, it's it's pretty amazing when you when you think like. <laughs> Like that stuff. Well, how a guy like this does have confidence issues when mm -hmm. he's written some of the most important songs. And hey, man, th hey, Thingamabob. Yeah. It's all about Thingamabob. Put that should have been on on the album right. too. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, um, being on the the album, um, I you know I, I sometimes I tease. I mean, I I love listen. I love Kareem Akur, but. I, I don't know if it should like end the album and if it does end the album, I think it maybe it should have been a hidden track where it's not listed. You know what I mean? Something kind of like how her majesty originally was, um, you know, because yeah. I mean, listen, um, or maybe I made it such a powerful track. I just always feel like that's the last that's song. The last like, song. In a way, yeah. Beautiful. Like, Cause like, again, with like flaming pie, it's like beautiful night should be the last damn song. <laughs> and then you got this little, no, but then he likes to close out with a little, you know, kind of I send you off that. kind I of song. Understand. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah, I think I, I think I talk in the book a little bit about that, about the sequencing of the album and how sort of strange it was to end with Karina Crory. Right. Um, and right. that maybe I'm amazed you know, really probably should have been the final track. <laughs> right. um, yeah. But, you know, yeah, you know, another aspect of the of the insecurity thing um, is that because he's insecure about stuff, he sometimes relies a little more than he should on other people's opinions. And they're not always the most qualified people. Um, I mean, I did an interview with him in 1990. And um, one of the nervier questions I asked him is, you know, why is it that, um, you know, flying to my home was just a B-side right. And, you know, it, why wasn't that on the album instead of something like Oué Le Soleil, which, yeah. you know, I really <laughs> didn't like that. But, you know, it's just it's just a Only on the yeah. CD, though, Alan, um, and tape. It wasn't on the vinyl. <laughs> and he said, well, here's the thing. I write them, so I like them all. And it's really hard for me to tell which ones – you know, sh which ones are the best, which one should be on the album. So I play them to my friend's kids and I figure out which ones they like the most. And I'm thinking, oh, man, you know, 
I don't know. I don't know that I trust oh. your friend's kids to um, <laughs> your, your sorry, your right. kid friends, right? Um, That's right. <laughs> To uh, you know, determine what should be right the running order, yeah, on the yeah. Uh, track listing. But you know, but with this album, I, um, I don't think he, I, I, I don't know that he had that much outside uh, input because you know we talk about the sequencing of the album with I think Robin Black and you know uh, didn't really get the impression that he was necessarily open to advice. He he decided. The way it would be and and that was it so uh why karina karori is last i don't know um maybe heather liked it <laughs> heather's friend <laughs> you know they saw that documentary yeah. and we're like oh we've got to write right. this and tack it on <laughs> yeah 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 uh, so. well anyways um we're as we close kind of close this out and we're in the you know mccartney legacy if you will do you do you place this 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 track i listen i mean that's just like right out of the gate we we get an instant classic of mccartney track i i consider it one of uh his greatest compositions obviously rob sheffield in that 100 countdown yeah. he put it as as his number one i mean well, how do you do you feel did you see that list and how did you feel yeah. about that being number one and then you know, what were your your thoughts on on where this track is in in the the you know the McCartney canon? Yeah, you know that is a, a harder question than you would think, just because the McCartney canon is so huge. You know, right. on this album, this is far and away the best track, but every night is pretty good too. You know, yeah. and, and there are some others. Um, but you know, not too long after this, he did "Backseat of My Car," which I think is an absolute masterpiece, and Same. "Little Lamb Dragonfly," which I also think right. is a masterpiece. And he didn't think enough of to finish for Ram. He he sort of left it right. as a leftover for Red Rose Speedway, and then had you know Denny or Denny Sywell, I think, said he helped finish it. Um, right. But it's brilliant. It's great. It's great. Mm -hmm. uh, you know so. There are so many incredible songs of his. I, I, I would. It would be hard for me to say that this is number one, because I kind of think I like "Backseat of My Car" better, um, mm. and "My Brave Face." You know, I mean, you right. go you go later in in the catalog too. You know, there's every so many incredible things. But you know, if let me put it this way: if I were to make, if I were to have put together pure McCartney, you know, like, cause I'm saying, you know, he, he basically needs a four disc greatest hits. <laughs> um, you know, maybe I'm amazed would absolutely be on it and it might be the opening track, you know, mm. just, not just right. chronologically, just because it is such a strong track, you know, right. let's say I might say it's within his top 10, maybe. Oh, for sure. Yeah. 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 I can go for that absolutely and I, it, yeah easily top 10 mm -hmm. um it, but as Alan says it, it's it's so big it's such a big discography in canon and sometimes I think sometimes we take a song like maybe I'm amazed for granted a little bit yeah it's a classic and we just forget about it we forget about how important it was right. at the time when we kind of go back and look at it I think it's oh yeah it's a classic right but it it remains it should be it should be ranked as highly as it should because it's that it's that important of a track in his personal life, his everything. And then just being a great song, you yeah. know, musically. And the fact that it, you know, it also hasn't been overplayed. I mean, you hear Good it a point. lot, but, yeah. but, you know, when, when maybe a maze comes on, you don't have the same, oh, not again, that yeah. you get when you hear Layla or Maggie May, mm. you know, the Rod right. Stewart's Maggie. Yeah, um, no, I hear you. Yep. Uh, you know, and, those are songs that I loved when they came out, and I still sort of I still love them. It's just that they were overplayed and, um, in a way, overstayed their welcome. But maybe I'm amazed that never happened. Not the and studio with the one, Alan, but I, Alan, I think as a former New Yorker, you can I think will agree with this and you know what I'm about to say. In New York, we have a station called 106.7 Light FM, hmm. and it's like kind of you know, 
kind of you know singer songwriter light stuff and they used to play the hell out of the live version of maybe i'm amazed mm. i don't know if you remember i don't know if you rec- but i mean that they, that station had that the live version in its rotation for years yeah that see that might have been after my time of listening to the radio a lot um, okay you know at, at a certain point um i had so many records and so many new records coming in that needed my attention that I stopped listening to, I mean, I remember when I started writing, I had the radio on all the time. I had WNEW FM on all the time. Um, and, and sometimes PLJ. And I don't think 106.7 was there yet. Um, but, you know, eventually it's like, okay, you know, I've got records to review. I've got records to hear. I've got pieces to learn. I've got all this stuff. And so I sort of switched over to record listening and, and not the radio yeah you know so but to your point other than the live version i mean which i heard quite a lot of on the radio but the, it does not the studio version as we're talking about that does not to alan's point you don't hear that and go oh it's layla again or you know yeah dream on hotel california no <laughs> it's, it doesn't right. have that quality <laughs> don't stop it. don't stop believing you know it's in, and on and on and on but, right. Uh, so, you know, yeah. so Paul might have in the back of his mind the complaint that, you know, maybe it isn't played enough. But in a way, that has helped it remain yeah. a beloved classic. Yeah. By, and then, you know, obviously keeping it alive in his live concerts and, you know, it, it, its legacy has continued. It, it, it sat dormant for a while, but he brought it back out again uh, in the last couple of years. And Right. Still it's a now a little song bit out of his vocal range, I think. You know, I would agree. <laughs> starting with like the that Saturday Night Live performance. Yes. Um, oh boy. You know, oh boy. Because that's another thing we that we didn't mention. It's it's actually a stunning vocal performance that requires a really supple voice and and range. And he had it at the time and for decades after. Um, it, it's only. Uh, the last what 10 15 years that it's been a little beyond him and you know maybe he could change the key he could take it down he will step. he will never do that he'll never do that i know but you Too know proud he was the song he was 28 yeah. years old when he recorded this 28 wasn't yeah. even 30 right right but 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 he lived a lifetime already in a way certainly <laughs> yes you know mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, Alan, yeah, Alan, thank you for for going down this road with uh, the first installment of this iconic song series. Uh, we we all know that, or hopefully everybody knows that you're also part of Things We Said Today podcast uh, with uh, with our friends Ken Michaels and and Darren DeVivo. Talk a little bit about that. You guys just dropped an episode uh, for this week, and uh, you guys have made the switch to doing every other week now, like twice a month now. Right. Of week- yeah. Right, because he has a pod. Ken has a podcast with you right. as, as well. Um, so you know, it, right. and, and we try to alternate. So one week he's doing right. yours, one week he's doing ours. Right. You know? And uh, right. Right. also, you know, I don't know about how you guys find it, but it gets really hard to think of a a fresh topic every week. You know, every two weeks at least gives us some time to think and to listen or to read books or whatever right. we need to do. But it should so. be easier for you guys because you guys are dealing with five camps where we're just dealing mainly dealing with mainly one. Camp. one. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, what's the but, latest episode that you guys uh, dropped? Um, well, you know, because I took uh, some time off to finish volume two, um, right. we are still catching up with certain things that we probably, you know, would have covered if if I hadn't taken time off. So this one was the Red and the Blue albums and uh, the underdubbed mixes of mm. uh, Band on the Run. On the run. Um, right. And I also threw in the new uh, HMC uh, bootleg with uh, because uh, I've, I've 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 heard the stuff on it. Uh, I heard okay. it while writing Volume One, actually, mm-hmm. um, and I don't think I don't think that disc is out there yet. But you know, just since your listeners are going to be obviously McCartney fans and will be interested right. in this, <laughs> what what the bulk uh, or the the main section of that disc is. Um, are the mixes that Jeff Emmerich made just before leaving Lagos. So yeah. songs that were not recorded in Lagos are obviously not there. Like not Jet, there. Right. 
Blackbird, 1985. Um, mm -hmm. And the ones that are there are in a very unfinished state, you know, far more unfinished than the underdub mixes. Um, wow. wow. You know, so, yeah. And Picasso, I mean, there's the, um, some really interesting stuff in there that is was sort of not mixed out or dubbed over or whatever, you know, they don't strike you quite as much on the finished version. But for instance, we, we know that Picasso was the last thing he recorded in Lagos and he recorded it at Ginger Baker's art Baker, studio. Right. Um, right. And the day before that, Fela Kuti had come to EMI studio right. to accuse him of being an African to steal the black man's music. And Paul's, oh no, we absolutely are not. Uh, and, you know, he played him some tapes and really for all the tapes he had done up to that point, there is nothing that you could say really is influenced by African music. And Ginger Baker came down, calmed uh, Fela Kuti down. Uh, right. And then Paul went and recorded in Ginger Studio the next day, you know, partly as a thank you, I think, right. for doing that. Right. But what do we hear in the very raw tapes of Picasso's last word, the closing yeah. section where they're going, ho, oh, hey, ho. Oh. Hey, oh. <laughs> Paul is also doing this, you know, ah, the waka waka, you know, you know um, just like this African kind of, of singing, right. you know, and it's sort of like, you know, it's so typical, Paul. You don't tell me what I can't do. Yes. Because now I'm going to do it. Now I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so, so in a way, fellow, in a way, fellow was a day late. Or I mean, a day early, I should say. That's right. You know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he could wow. have beat Paul Simon to it. You know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh. But you know, and, and you hear that. I think you hear that on the underdub mixes too. Um, but it's right. even clearer on the, on what's going to come out on the HMC mix. And Band on the Run is 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 kind of a mess on the HMC one. You know, there's a right. lot of stuff that is not finished. Um, there's a, a couple of bars that are, you know, have repeated lyrics that he obviously sort of edited out because it, that was a mistake. Um, but, you know, so if I were Paul, I wouldn't have put that out. I would have put out the underdub mixes as he did if, if I wanted to do something to show the process of Band on the Run. But for someone right. like, you know, me or Adrian or you guys or, you know, anyone really right. fascinated with how his music comes together, this bootleg is a killer and well and th that and then the underdub would have made that that box set in 2010 so much more worth it yeah mm -hmm. so much more it and so much more interesting even if we never get those those supposed you know uh uh no, those demos that Sywell talks about those two alone you know would have would have would have been easy easy score or i mean uh you know 10 times better than what we did eventually get Sure. I do want those demos, though. I mean, that ha I, I really well, right. wish he would put those out. Um, yeah. I want to see whether Danny Sywell is right, saying that it's better right. than the finished the drums. <laughs> right. <laughs> and his drumming. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. So um, as we can expect, volume two, as of right now, we're expecting it to be released in December. December uh, 10th. Of Legacy, December mm -hmm. 10th. So please, if you want this series to continue, which I hopefully we all do, please help support uh, purchase the book, whether in physical format or Kindle, uh, whatever way you can to to help support and get what I think. Like I said, this is the most important series in in the McCartney car solo career, as we know. As we talked about, you know, when you when you see the bios in the past, it's this thick of Beatles and this thick of solo. You know, this is what we all deserve and all and all we have wanted for all these years, and we're finally getting it. So. And, and the and the work that Adrian and Alan have been putting into this to this series is legendary, and, and it should be talked about. You should just write a book on the all the uh, research that you guys have put into it. Uh, yeah, you know, that would be a fascinating read it. too. Yeah. The story right. of the, the McCartney legacy. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Right. So 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 Alan, we really appreciate you coming on and and, and talking. Well, thank you for having me. You know, hopefully, yeah, next month hopefully we'll we'll have Adrian. Uh, to join us as well. Uh, Andy, uh, what do you got going on for your other channel? 
Uh, just that latest uh, review that I did at, um, you know, with a buddy of mine over at uh, NJIT uh, radio station on Yes, which we kind of chewed the fat on some progressive rock for mm. about an hour and a half. And uh, that's been on my channel for about a week or so now. And that's the latest I've got on mine. But that's it. All right. And talk more talk. Uh, we'll be... Uh... We we'll back uh, as we're as this is a Saturday as is posting. I think we're 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 back on Monday, and I think we're gonna talk about the uh, that uh, Rob Sheffield 100 uh, solo Beatles countdown, which again is as we all know, it's just his opinion. So <laughs> we're all all of our lists would be would be totally different. Uh, but uh, again, real quick, Alan, did is, you think Imagine yeah. would be number one when you first saw the list coming out, or no? Uh, I, you know, I don't even remember <laughs> what was number one. I mean, I, I, I skimmed it. I looked it over and I read bits of it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I like Rob. I mean, Rob is uh, a very, very good Beatles journalist, I think. And, uh, you know, his opinions are not necessarily mine, but, um, but, right. but he uh, makes a case for his opinions. And I like that. So, mm -hmm. so I'll, I'll, I'll be listening to your to your podcast about that cool gotcha gotcha yeah so um again please check out our youtube channel two legs a paul mccartney podcast and and please subscribe there if you have any ideas for a show or if you want to say hey look and if you're going to continue this iconic song series maybe you should talk about this particular track uh email us at two legs podcast at gmail.com um when we get done here maybe we're going to talk a second about which song to do next and um you know, it's great having you guys here. Thank you for listening. So as always, for Tom, Andy, Alan Cozen, have a great day and a beautiful night. Take care, everyone. See you. to Two Legs, a Paul McCartney podcast, hosted by Tom Hunyadi and Andy Nichols, with musical contributions by Dylan